Welcome to Enter the Cage, where we review the films of our greatest national treasure, Hollywood's most interesting man, Nicolas Cage. I'm Tyler Flynn, aka The Whedon Fan, and I'm joined as always by my co-hosts, Nate Treese. Hi. And Bonnie Jordan. Hey there. We're also joined by our first reviewer co-host, our good friend, Leon Thomas. Hi everyone, good to be here. So as we like to do with guest hosts who haven't been on the show before, we'd like to ask them about their first memory of Nicolas Cage. So, Leon, when were you first introduced to the man, the myth, the legend? Wow, the, the, the sad, sad answer to that is I, I don't remember. He's been in so many movies that if I saw him when I was a young man, I just don't remember it. He's just, he, it, that's like asking me, like, what was my first, like, Liam Neeson performance I remember? It's, it's <laughs> just, he's just been around so long. Actually, I do remember that one. It was Kroll. But, uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, Nicholas Cage, I can't remember. I remember, um, the first time I was really impressed with him was when I watched, uh, Wild at Heart, uh, a David Lynch film. Mm, um, but I'm positive I've seen something before that. I know I've seen Face Off, and that was, I saw that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. I'll, say, I'll 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 just say face off, where he got to play two people. I think. Oh yes, great performance. Oh yeah, <laughs> tour de force. Asking when you first were introduced to Nick Cage is like asking when the first time you saw the color blue. Right. Like, he's always been with us. It's just <laughs> yeah. a thing. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for sharing, Leon. And now it's time to move into another fun segment in our podcast that we like to call. So this week, we're going to switch it up a bit, and Bonnie is going to be doing Fake Fact Face Off. For those of you who haven't listened to our podcast before, this little segment is basically our elaborate way of playing Two Truths and a Lie. So Bonnie is going to give us two true facts about Nicolas Cage and his career, and one of them is fake. So we have to, out of the three, we have to determine which one is the false one. So take it away, Bonnie. All right. Three Nicolas Cage facts. Fact number one. When approached about getting his wax sculpture done for the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, Nick Cage refused, citing voodoo purposes as his reasoning. Number two, Nicolas Cage once got a birthday cake in the shape of a cockroach. Or, number three, Nicolas Cage once spent over $200,000 on a dinosaur skull. I I believe the money one, based on his, uh, like, um unfortunate spending habits so i it, that's that's a possibility even if it's not true i still kind of believe it yeah i feel like i read in the newspaper that he was in like a bidding war with leo dicaprio over like a fossil or something so i think that one's that one's true uh oh but that ah uh, but the, the other two are just like so we know he believes in voodoo i have a trump card for one of them i don't know if you want me to play it all right but a trump card are, Okay, I have been to the Wax Museum in Las Vegas, and I saw Nicolas Cage's statue there. Oh, okay. Well, we can, yeah. then we can eliminate that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what, what was the other one? Yeah, can you repeat them again? Um, the one you guys haven't discussed yet is uh, Nicolas Cage once got a birthday cake in the shape of a cockroach. I, I think it's, I'm going to say it's that one, but I, it's not like I'm really sure. Uh. I think? also I, I also feel like it's it's the cockroach one, not because I don't think Nicolas Cage would do that, uh, but just because I have a feeling that well we know that the Madame Tussauds one is is true if we believe Tyler and he's not just setting us up to guess wrong so that he can win. <laughs> uh, you never know. I'm sure like that. <laughs> no, the fact I'm was gonna... that he re- he refused <laughs> to let right. that happen. I'm, oh, oh, okay. He had to give his consent. You're wait. You're I'm, not allowed. Wait a minute. You're not allowed to just make a sculpture of a person without their consent. I feel I I could doodle <laughs> Nicolas Cage right now. What is he gonna do? Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. All I'm saying is I I stood next to a statue in Las Vegas and he was incredible. So oh, okay, it, it's a real thing. It was his best recent <laughs> it was performance. Incredible. Yes. Well, that was because of the voodoo, probably. <laughs> uh, right. Then I don't know. I'm going to say, I'm just going to lock in cockroach. I'm just going to say it. I have no confidence, but I'm going to say cockroach. I am okay. going cockroach as well, actually. 
So, Leon, final answer, everyone. We're set. Yeah, cockroach. Okay. Is. And Bonnie, what is the the true answer? Okay, the uh, the false fact was the Madame Tussauds <laughs> one. What? We made that up. <laughs> oh boy! So he got so he got his. What? Okay. No. Yeah. So, so they just made it without his permission. Have... <laughs> no, or they could have had his permission. <laughs> oh my! All right. Because that's the fake one. <laughs> so we don't. So he did home. actually have a birthday cake in the shape of a cockroach, and it was after he ate a live cockroach during Vampire's Kiss. Oh. I haven't okay. seen that one. Oh, oh boy. Well, thanks for that, Bonnie. Um, Now it's time to move on to the main portion of our podcast, the movie review. And this week we watched Rumblefish. Rusty James. Biff Wilcox looking for you, Rusty James. I'm not hiding. He says he's going to kill you, Rusty James. You know, if you're going to lead people, you have to have somewhere to go. So to do a brief synopsis of the film, stars Matt Dillon as the lead character, Rusty James, who lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's kind of a juvenile delinquent. He runs with some of the local gangs, trying to live up to his brother, the motorcycle boy's namesake, and become a local legend. But he's not as smart or as tough, and it's just about him dealing with teen angst and his own insecurities. Would anyone else want to offer something to that synopsis? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think it also, I think it also taught, I mean, obviously Rusty James is the main character, but there's also like uh, Mickey Rourke's uh, character, the motorcycle boy also has like a fairly significant arc as well. Uh, and uh, you kind of like, I don't know, there's like, there's, there's sort of a lot of, uh, what were you going to say, Bonnie? It feels like it's supposed to be a movie about mental health, but it's not sure that it is. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I really, really despise this movie, you guys. Really? Okay. This is one of the hardest movies we've done thus far to get through. Like, it was a chore to watch this film. Right. Well, I, I I, will admit I am uh, I'm an uncultured man. Uh <laughs> So I, I understood, I actually really, I mean, I, when I was watching it, I, I kind of liked a lot of the ways it was shot because I feel like, uh, you know, just from the research I did, like Coppola really went like uh, very experimental. Oh, yeah. The artistry it. is amazing. Uh, with, like the shadow work and the colors oh, oh, yeah. and yeah. the framing. But the actual story is bare, bare to none. Well, I uh, some of the performances I was into, some I wasn't. I think hate is kind of a strong word because for me anyways because i I wouldn't say i i don't know if, I don't know that I liked it, but uh there was uh there was something to it you know I lo- i'll I'll just jump in here and say uh that i I guess I'm probably gonna be the only one who really really liked it. Uh, I went into this completely blind uh you said, hey, you want to watch Rumblefish and I said, sure. Uh, that was that was my thought process of the whole thing. I I just said why not, and then I I didn't know anything about it, and I loved it. I I really enjoyed the. I mean, the dialogue is theater dialogue. It's not movie dialogue, <laughs> and that and that it can really throw you off. And it really threw me off at, at first because everyone kept calling Rusty James. Rusty James. <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah. aspect reminded me of the room where everyone's character just says the other character's name all the time. Like, yeah. oh hi Mark, oh hi Rusty James, right. over and over again. <laughs> yeah, when, why? When, like we forgot who they are. When um when everyone started calling him Rusty James, I'm like, oh okay, well they're they're hammering something in, and then they just kept doing it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's here. I I liked a lot about the movie, so I'm just gonna go through a big list of things I liked, and then you guys can tell me how wrong I am. Uh, the, the, definitely the visuals, um, the thing about shooting in black and white, it's not just, it looks fancy. It, it, it's there. You can do things with shadows and with light that you just can't entirely do with, uh, w- with color. And I, th- I think it, it sort of worked here. There's, um, well, the, there, the only color in the film, of course, are the, the, um, titular rumble fish themselves. Mm-hmm. They, uh, the fish that we see only in color, uh, did, did it before Schindler's list. 
so there. Um, <laughs> take the, take that Spielberg. Take that Spielberg. You, I'm sure he really cares. Um, I, I I like I like that it, it lent it some significance to it. And by now we've seen it all in in Schindler's List and Sin City and the sequel to Sin City and a bunch of other things. But I think it was mm-hmm. uh, certainly uh, interesting for its time. Um, another thing I liked about this movie, and this is just in a very fanboyish kind of way, and has nothing to do with um, theme and uh, and visuals or anything. I really liked going into this movie not knowing who was in it because it was just stacked with actors I really like. So I just turned it on. I had no idea who was in it besides Cage. I was like, oh, Matt Dillon, that's cool. He's not in a lot of stuff anymore. It's good to see him in another role I like. And then, oh, nice guy Eddie is here. And Tom Waits? (laughs) Tom Waits is in this movie? I had no idea he was in this. It's like, I've been a fan of Tom Waits before I really knew who Tom Waits was because because I really loved Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, me too. Another uh, another film by the same director, yeah. and uh, so I, I really liked his performance. I learned late only later that he was a musician that I en- <laughs> ended up being my, my favorite musician. So when Tom yeah. Waits just shows up and growls out all his lines, I was really uh, excited about that. And then Cage shows up and that poofy haircut, and <laughs> it was it, I just really and Dennis Hopper and just everyone. It just Lawrence was that. Um, was that Lawrence Fishburne? In there? Yes, it was. Yes, young, it was. young Lawrence Fishburne. I think still, no, still known as Larry. Yeah, yeah. I remember he was credited as Larry Fishburne in a Nightmare on Elm Street three. That's yeah. that's the earliest film besides this one I can remember him in. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah. The soon to be Lawrence Fishburne was in that. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I to me, I mean, yeah, you could say it's partly about mental health, but to me, it also just seemed to be a very simple story about being dissatisfied with where you are and being trapped and wanting to get out. And that, I mean, they, they hammered that in, unfortunately too much when they started looking at the fish and they started being very, very obvious about the connection between the fish and themselves and where they are in their lives. And they want to be free and go into the ocean and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that part was kind of obvious, but it also felt like it was, it was very theatrical. It wasn't, um, it wasn't subtle. And that, and, but I, I, I was kind of okay with that because the movie never had movie had no, uh, it never pretended that it was, um, that it was subtle. It was very, very, very much from the beginning. It's like, look, this is the movie. We're going to speak in very verbose, uh, verbose ways. We're going mm-hmm. to, we're going to show you exactly what we mean by all of this. And our fight scenes are going to be ridiculous and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fight scenes, by the way. It, it was, it was like it reminded. That was like a choreographed dance. It was. It, it reminded. Kind of was like a little West Side Story ish. I, I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. It. It. I. I. The only. Um, 80s fight scene uh that that ridiculous i remember uh in the same vein was they live when roddy <laughs> Pipe, when roddy piper, oh, yeah. roddy piper had to fight keith david in an alleyway yeah, they um, beat the crap out of each other oh my god that was the best <laughs> but yeah no I, I enjoyed the fight sequences and um Oh yeah, and I, I guess I forgot to mention uh, that Mickey Rourke is in this movie too. In in terms of uh, great actors uh, that I love, it was Mickey Rourke before his face exploded. Oh and, yeah, uh, this is the youngest I've ever seen Mickey Rourke, and I didn't know who he was at first. Well, this is probably like because I think he was in I think he was in a supporting role in Body Heat prior to this, and then that was it as far as things that he did like in films before this. So this uh, this is definitely his first starring role, and uh, he looks he looks good. I gotta say. Yeah, he looks kind of like James Spader to me. I, well, I, I, I'm not with you on that. He I looks I, okay. I, 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 I wouldn't be afraid of James Spader, uh, like 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 an '80s James Spader. But I, I, I was a little. I would be intimidated if I met like early '80s Mickey Rourke. All right. The uh, I, I, I appreciate, like you said, Leon, the artistry and the different way the the shots are framed and the col- use of color and the attempts at metaphor but i just feel like there's no substance like i didn't feel a connection with the characters compared to the outsiders what he filmed right before this where that's a, a timeless story and i remember reading the book and also loving the movie and having a real connection with those characters but here it's just so fast-paced and trying so hard to be stylistic that i didn't feel like it had an emotional grounding to it well i'll i'll give you this it's hard to it's hard to completely connect with rusty james because he's such a dick 
Um, <laughs> he, 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 there is no, I mean, you can feel for him in that, you know, in that sense that he wants to be something more than he is, but mm-hmm. the way he goes about it is basically just still just latching on to his brother and treating, yep. treating people pretty poorly throughout yeah, the whole yeah. thing. So if you, if you look at it in, in sort of a broader sense, I, you might enjoy it, but if you, if you're just fastened to Rusty James throughout the whole thing and the movie does, does keep us with him. He is like, I guess the main character. Um, mm-hmm. I can certainly see, um, uh, disliking it for that reason he's he's i wouldn't say he's an irredeemable character though because he's a child he doesn't yeah. look like one because matt Dillon is playing him in his 20s but he's a <laughs> piece he's supposed to be like 17 yeah and dickish characters aren't necessarily a bad story though i mean you can have anti-heroes like we have tony soprano or walter white like you can have bad people as the lead character it's just the way it was portrayed didn't really <laughs> he's no jive with he, he's nowhere he was- near I'm sorry. The way it's treated throughout too is like everyone is always like, "No, no, you're never going to be a motorcycle boy." Like, "No, you really, you really, you don't understand." Like, all your aspirations are are trash, and <laughs> you're never going to be like that. <laughs> and so, like, I, not only is he a dick, but also I feel sorry for him the whole time. And like, there's just like no like good things, no good feelings towards Rusty at all. Well, this is actually a good a good segue here because uh, I. I want to talk. I have a. I have a. Uh, a proposition about the role that Nicolas Cage plays in this uh, as Smokey. Okay. Uh, he broke the bro code. I well. I was so pissed I, at that. Yeah, that's the thing is I'm I'm putting it to you, uh, and I would just like to have this out there for discussion. Is Nicolas Cage, in some ways, the villain of this movie? Hmm. Uh, well, he wants, I mean, he wants to usurp his, um, his, his, uh, Rusty James's position. Um, yeah. I mean, he, say- he certainly does it, you know, he usurps him as the boyfriend and he very clearly wants to be in charge and maybe he should cause he's obviously smarter. Yes. Um, I, 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 I think, actually- I think the real villain was teen angst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, in that regard, I can I can certainly uh, relate to the characters just because at that time in your life, all you do want to do is get out and, and be free and be be that rumble fish in the water. Um, but yeah, I so the problem, I guess the biggest problem with the film and I, I did like it, but I, I will say that the biggest problem with the film is that Rusty James does not come across as someone how do I put this? He he's he's unappealing. He's an unappealing mm-hmm. character, and he's surrounded mm-hmm. by more appealing characters. And and th- but but the movie doesn't make you want to root for him to be better when he's yeah. just constantly just act, acting act, acting acting a fool. out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's it's not like watching The Breakfast Club. <laughs> where where you you see these uh, teenagers going through their problems, and even Bender is uh, he he's kind of a dick throughout but he's he makes an effort towards mm-hmm. a cu- in a couple uh, times yeah. and you're like oh okay maybe he won't be shit for the rest of his life <laughs> but rusty james i the, the the most redeeming thing about him is he tries to keep his brother out of trouble at the very last minute yeah yeah um to, but to compare it again oh no, go sorry ahead, go ahead Oh, to compare it again to the outsiders, like that it was again, they're both written by the same author and it's this kind of a similar situation, but I feel like that one worked more because the main character of Pony Boy also had like a good supporting cast of characters, but they emphasized like the class warfare and kind of the hopelessness of their situation. They were still good people, but they're just in a bad place trying to get out of it. Rusty James has all the opportunities to leave and everyone's telling him you could do better than this. You don't need to live in your brother's shadow, but he's just so one track mind that he doesn't see that and basically shoots himself in the foot all the time. So it's, it doesn't really have the same. Well, I think it speak. I think, yeah. I think Leon's kind of, I, th- I think he has explained uh, why I didn't necessarily like enjoy the movie that much. It's just the fact that in pretty much any scene where Rusty James is interacting with another person, you're rooting you're taking the other person's side i think <laughs> i think i think perhaps only the scene where he's in the fight with biff wilcox 
when like uh you know like they clearly establish that biff has brought his uh his gang and then he fights with a knife when clearly rusty is unarmed and then he cuts him with like a shard of glass like while he's distracted and stuff it's like yeah i can root for i can root for rusty uh james against this guy but like every other interaction he has with the character where like uh Sophia Coppola has the small cameo as like the uh, uh, motorcycle boy's heroin addicted girlfriend, and he's just like a real jerk to her in that scene. And then like uh, he's like a real jerk. And then like there's a scene where they're walking around uh, in Tulsa, and he just like like put like knocks the guy over and kicks him while he's on the ground. <laughs> it's like he's just get out yeah. of my way for no reason. Yeah, there's just it, there's just moments like that where it's like I I just can't I just can't root for this guy at all, and it's not like. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or especially the way he treats uh, uh, what's his girlfriend. Yeah, I was gonna say what's what's Diane yeah. Lane's character Patty, Patty. I think is the name of her character in that. Yep. I thought Sofia Coppola was her younger sister. Well, maybe she was, but I don't think so. No, wait, no, she was. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of. Uh, the the blonde girl. Yeah, I was thinking of well because I know Sofia Coppola had the cameo, and then uh, there was another actress who uh, uh, Kim something. I think it is. Well, this is why uh, I should have written that down in my notes beforehand, but it's fine. Anyone else? Uh, as soon as he saw, as soon as I saw the police officer, all I could think of, of was Axe Cop. Axe Cop. <laughs> yep. No, seriously. <laughs> okay, so I'm With not the, the only. The Fu Manchu no, mustache. No, no. Yes. All right. Yeah, just the way, just his attitude and everything too. It was just like. Well, all of their interactions with that cop, that's a good segue. It was com- so uncomfortable. Like, I have no idea why this cop is out to get Motorcycle Boy. I know. No idea. Well, because we haven't that's seen Motorcycle Boy do anything but just be kind of, like, introspective and aloof, like, since oh he my gets God. back. And so. Motorcycle Boy is basically a hipster. Like, just off in his dreamy wonderland, kind of, the he whole time. He creeped me out the entire time just because of the way that he spoke. Just kind of like, like in these like, eloquent, poetic syntax. Well, completely of. like under his breath the entire time in like a, like, you should go kill yourself kind of like, <laughs> like, I like, like, like I said, like, kind of felt like he was like trying to persuade everyone all the time in this like creepy voice. I mean, most of them, uh, <laughs> didn't think it was fun when we had a fight. Man, most of them were scared stuff. I mean, blind terror in a fight can easily pass the courage. The motorcycle boy. I wonder why somebody hasn't taken a rifle and blown your head off. Well, even the most primitive society has an innate respect for the insane. I I was actually kind of... It, his performance kind of worked for me, but I feel like... Uh, I don't know. I I think it it would have been more effective for me if he if he wasn't, you know, like kind of wearing a blazer and uh like kind of had like uh like kind of arty like new wave kind of fashion going on. I because mm-hmm. I I mean, I know he's I mean, I I don't know that he's like a I know he's not technically supposed to be a biker uh like gang leader like at this point. Uh, he was in the past, we gather, but it's still just kind of funny to me that like he's seen as this troublemaker and stuff that he's like this tough you know alpha male when he's just kind of walking around looking like he's in joy division or something (laughs) yeah it it doesn't and and like i spent the whole movie being like so he was a gang leader like like why is he such a legend like why do people care so much because he's obviously just like there and aimless at this point i don't know I, and they're yeah, I well, they're all like, and he's a fucking prince. Like they're <laughs> they're like praising him the whole time, and like he's such a like he's such an amazing person, and everyone just worships him and loves him. But you can't be like him, Rusty James. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was, just, <laughs> what? I did feel a little sorry. I did feel a little sorry for Rusty James when they're in that uh, in that pool hall, and he's like, "I'm going to be just like him." And then just that random guy's like, "No, you're never going to be like him." I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah." That black guy, like, who the hell are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> The deep a man, you know? You know, I'm gonna be just like him too. I'm gonna look like him. You ain't gonna never be like that, man. How do you know, man? What the f you know? I might look like him. You ain't gonna be like that, man. He's a prince, you know? That's right. Give it time, buddy boy. Give it time. 
You know, it's weird, but even um, even uh, motors. I can't remember the the character's real name. I just call all him calling him motorcycle boy. Um, but he even he kind of puts down uh, Rusty James at one point because Rusty James and I'm saying I can't I can't not say his full. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Rusty yeah. James says RJ. Yeah, um, R- yeah, RJ says to uh, his brother. He says, "Oh, you you saw our mom." And then uh, motorcycle boy says, "Yeah, she looks just like me." And then RJ says, "Oh, that she must look a little bit like me too." And he just there's just no reaction. <laughs> yeah, like you don't look like me. You're just yeah. Matt Dillon. <laughs> yeah. Some of the other actors, the character that made the least amount of sense to me was Lawrence Fishburne. Like, yeah. this is a grown man. Why is he hanging out and facilitating fights for gangs well, of teenage boys? Yeah. They don't. Why does he care like, at how all? How old is he supposed to be? Well, yeah, that's the thing. Is that they completely didn't, like, like out of like yeah, the code. Yeah, he's wearing well because he's wearing like you know like a fedora and a suit and everything. So you a white like you assume he's older. It's your instinct to think he's older, but at the same time, it's like, why would he be hanging out with these people unless, Mm -hmm. like, he was closer to their age, and they never really provide an adequate answer for that. And he has, like, in the fight, he's the one who throws that chain for Rusty to swing on. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 super involved, you know, and Mm -hmm. he shows up, like... uh, He's like the fight promoter. He just just kind of bankrolls it and, like, spices it up by throwing in chains and knives and shit. (laughs) (laughs) He just lives a boring life. That is a good backstory. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll fill in the blanks. I I feel like that's good enough. uh... Best scene in the movie besides, well, as part of the fight, was right after when Motorcycle Boy, like, revs his bike and it hits the dude in the face that <laughs> it does like, that huge backflip oh my like, yeah, god he back that, flipped. Bike flipped. <laughs> that was like out of face off or some over the top action movie like I whoa that's so much <laughs> and it, it was, was so pretty stylized <laughs> rewind and rewatch over and over again right. <laughs> well i did rewind it twice just to like because i saw like because you see him like rev it and then you just like see the bike hit him like without like really moving full like visibly moving forward it's just there and so i like watched it slow down just to see like <laughs> how they how they did that and it's it I, I have to admit it is a visually arresting uh uh scene mm-hmm. it is uh well, the movie is gorgeous i mean we can yeah. we can uh, debate the uh the characters and and the plot and and there certainly is uh room for improvement but uh visually i i just love that i think that was the main thing for me that just it was just a gorgeous picture to watch yeah i liked uh, uh i i really liked the uh how they had the uh they like all the clouds were always moving in time lapse i thought that was kind of neat the way they did that Speaking of time, uh, the way the chronology of this movie was very confusing to me, especially right after Rusty James gets cut in the stomach in the fight. And then he's like lying in the bed and he's having what I think is a dream sequence where he's at school seeing his girlfriend in various scenes. But then it turns out it's real time because he comes home and he's wearing a different shirt and he still has the cut. So like just the way things were arranged, I didn't really make sense. Does anyone know? It could have been oh. it could have been edited a bit better. I'll 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 grant you that. I I was confused in that part too. So I'm with you okay. there. Uh, what did we think about the uh, score? the The actual music was good, but some of the ambient noise, especially with the diner sequence Ooh, and the guy like chewing gum really loud, <laughs> or the water dripping, it just got aggravating after a while so so you were okay so so you didn't mind the score because i i thought as much as i i actually do really like Stuart copeland's work uh like scoring stuff but i thought uh i don't know that all like the synth heavy stuff worked uh for like the tone yeah it felt kind of off there were there were moments where i felt like the score was like way creepier than the moment was supposed to be yeah or that, or and on, and on the opposite side, like especially the way it uh, it ended, I felt like it was kind of like there. It was a lot more upbeat in parts than, yeah. uh, than the uh, the the images warranted. It got uh, kind of elevator musicy. Yeah. Well, my understanding, I'm not uh, an expert, obviously, but my understanding is that when like a lot of sequencing and uh, like different music programs and stuff first like became available there was like uh 
maybe a little overindulgence in uh, in like movie scores back then when that technology first became like something that was widely used. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I also another character that confused me was uh, Tom Waits as the diner owner. Uh, like, I'm, I'm going to stop you right this... there. Do not say anything bad about Tom Waits. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I or like his character. character. Uh, you let me talk, Nate. I have feelings <laughs> and opinions. Um, I liked his character, but those times when he was just doing intense monologues about life or time, and there's like no one immediately speaking to him, or no one actually in the diner, like who is he talking to? It's why is he he's talking to the audience? Things? Right. I mean, he's talking to the audience. I, it's it's. I don't think it's more complicated than that. He's yeah. just narrate. He's narrating the scene because they said, "Well, we've got Tom Waits." So we might as well get the most out of that voice. Yeah. Well, why not well, have Rusty James well, narrate? He's the no. main character. Oh my really god! Hear, Matt, you don't no. want to take. You're I, not going to take. I wouldn't want Rusty to, James but it would make more sense. Part. I think they made the right call and gave uh, Rusty James the least amount to say to the audience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just keep, just keep, just keep yammering at your girlfriend about bullshit and let uh, and let Tom Waits or, and and the other characters move things along. Yeah, I I'm gonna say. Uh, uh, like Leon said, uh, it's a very theater type uh, script. And uh, so I was cool with there being sort of an aside where this guy who presumably the character Benny that Tom Waits plays, he's an observer because all these people, you know, all, all these like uh, these dramas are playing out in his uh, place on a regular basis. So he kind of, you know, gets the chance to, you know, wax eloquent to the audience a little bit about, like uh, you know what's going on sort of in the movie, and I thought that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. The other artistic touch I really liked was when Rusty James got knocked out and had like that out of body experience where he's floating. Yeah, that was really creative. I like that, that a special lot. Special effect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> I love. Yeah, that. yeah, it was good because oh my god. He- he goes and, you know, like he goes and it's like, you know, he's imagining like uh, Patty being all sad and broken up over him, too. It was a good uh, reflective. It moment. was a good little oh, thing. It was so yeah. cheesy. <laughs> In the special features, they reveal that they made a full body cast of Matt Dillon. So it was just yeah. his hands were sticking out and then they just rotated the body and so they moved it along. Oh, <laughs> pretty interesting. That's amazing. Huh. Yeah. Uh, OK, so I guess. We probably do actually need to talk a little bit about Nicolas Cage. Um, <laughs> when, for when, the five minutes he's in this movie. Yeah, when, when you recommended this uh, movie uh, that we watch, I said, sure. Oh, it's a Nicolas Cage movie I don't know much about. He's in it, but it's not a Nicolas Cage movie. No. He's, he's, he's not only a supporting character, he's a minor character who has like <laughs> one big scene and then, then just a lot of bits and pieces. Well, elaborating on that, uh, this movie was actually filmed before Valley Girl, which is his first main starring role that we reviewed last week, but uh, it was released after Valley Girl. So he goes from having no lines in Fast Times to starring role in Valley Girl to being a barely supporting character in this one. So it's backwards, but that's the way the production happened. So uh, we've got, we've, we've, uh, we decided on our format of uh, going in chronological order, and uh, that means <laughs> we, we suffer accordingly. Yes. Uh, but okay. we don't have we don't have too many more, uh, you know, like uh, small or s- like bit parts for Nicolas Cage after this, though. Yes. Uh, well, and you know what? I enjoyed his performance in this movie way better than I liked him in Valley Girl. I agree with you. Yes. I, I think he did. Consensus. He did a good job. <laughs> He's well. I thought I thought he did a lot of good stuff with his character because he's kind of like, you know, like a little bit of a voice of reason. And, uh, you know, the character of Steve is like is sort of the voice of reason, too. But he's not like he's clearly not like one of them. So it doesn't like uh, register, I guess. Right. Uh, whereas uh, with Smokey, he's kind of, uh, you know, like being cautious, but he's also kind of got that cool like. uh gangster vibe too and they kind that's, of that's more how i wanted him to be in valley girl oh yeah he the, he probably rebellious bad boy yeah, yeah. that well yeah. Uh, with and then, but intelligent and then he reveals himself to be sort of a machiavellian uh mastermind behind uh uh his breakup with patty and uh mm-hmm. you know that he actually has ambitions to be well i think he says like 
there's like there are not going to be any more gangs around here like in the old days. But if there were, I'd be in charge and you'd be like, you know, my second like my second hand guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that was kind of and he didn't. And they, like there's a really good touch of him kind of like looking at himself in the mirror during that scene to being like, hey, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> In the special features, you have to watch the one on the making of the movie because they interview Nick Cage for like two minutes and he gives the backstory that he created for his character. It is batshit insane. Being the character of Smokey, he came from Japan in terms of management. He came from Shakespeare in terms of Iago. And he came from Florence in terms of Machiavelli. And also, when I was uh, young, I remember an event when I went to the neighborhood ditch and I was swimming in like the moss and everything. I don't know why I did that, but I came across a very large, a very large lizard. And I noticed that on his face he had a smile, and then he went so far as to bite me. And I realized that the smile wasn't because he was smiling, simply because he just liked to bite, you know? And I put that into the character. And so if you put all these things together, then you get smoky. Diane Lane is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. She reminds me of like a golden age of Hollywood movie starlet yeah. with the black and white. And she's oh she's so pretty she was also uh in around this time i feel well because she's also in the cotton club which is another uh movie coming up uh Ooh. and uh she's not as good in that one as she is in this one because she turns in a good performance in this i feel uh yeah. she's also in one of my uh favorite uh 80s movies and i do have to add the caveat that it's one of my favorite 80s movies uh streets <laughs> of fire by walter hill uh, where she plays the love interest uh, in that. Uh, but she's not that great. She's not too good in that one either. I think this is a really good, like, solid early performance from her. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she doesn't have, like, a whole lot to do, but I do sort of like the fact that... Uh, I mean, she does a really good job of portraying someone who's actually, like, in love with this guy and then, like, realizes what a what a jerk he is and then kind of stands up yeah. for herself well and then well yeah and then like also she does i think she does a really good like job in that in like sort of her last uh her last like major scene in the movie where she's kind of just like embarrassed for rusty james you know she's not even like mad at him or anything she's just kind of like uh oh, how awkward this must be for you what what did everyone think of the the conclusion the final scene with or the final act of the motorcycle boy. I was like, so confused. What? Yeah, I was con- I was confused as well. I, well, I, I wasn't. I Look. thought it was pretty clear. I, you know, he. I think. I think motorcycle boy was done. I think he's had enough. Anybody wanted to. You know, basically, I think he wanted to get shot. I think he wanted to be done. I think he wanted to free his brother from following him around for the rest of his life and getting him into trouble with with what he was up to. Yeah. And he, I got that. I thought he was going to go jump in the river. Well, no, so he, he why wanted would, to... why would the cop have shot him though? Because Over that cop, goldfish. the cop had it in for him. He knew the yeah. cop was just waiting for an excuse to just completely destroy him. Yeah. So I and, thought that was what that was about. Yeah. And that's why, and that's also the reason why the cop, uh, like lets Rusty James go. Cause he's like, Hey, I, uh, He's like, hey, I, you know, like, because they're about to arrest him. And he's like, hey, no, let him go. Because he basically is like, you know, I've I've freed him from his brother's uh, legacy, whether he wants, you know, whether he wanted me to or not. So, uh, you know, he's got to go off and have his have like a second chance. I did like that he made it to California. That was a nice closing. Yeah, I thought it looked nice. Yeah. Uh, it was a good yeah. shot. Oh, fun fact, uh, when the part when Rusty and Motorcycle Boy and Steve are walking down the street in like the shady part of town, mm-hmm. the one prostitute who comes to proposition them is the author of the book, S.E. Hinton. Oh, okay. Mm. And also the co-author of the, uh, of the screenplay, too. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So interesting little cameo there. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think, I think I read that, that, uh, like all, like I think five of her novels have been adapted to film, and there's only like one that doesn't have Matt Dillon in it, because uh, because there was Rumblefish, there's The Outsiders, there's uh, uh, Tex, which is actually like a Walt Disney uh, live action film, 
uh, it's not quite as uh, as graphic or dark as because technically all of her like novels fall under the young adult category, which is weird. They're pretty mature though. Well, what the YA like genre used to be a lot more hardcore than it is now. Thanks, Twilight. Well, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Not, not completely. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it was one of those things where it was like technically it was considered a young adult novel if just like the protagonists were young adults, not necessarily like uh, uh, if it was like deliberately tailored to appeal to young adult sensibilities, right. uh, or like what what like the like publishing companies like think young adult sensibilities are. So. I did think, well, I did, and I did feel like, you know, the whole, like, teen angst stuff, like, it makes more sense if you think about it in the context of, like, this is a, like, a script based on a, mo uh, or based on a novel that was written, like, about, you know, and for, like, young people to read. I have ordered the book. I am super excited to read it, because I'd like to make more sense of the film. So, oh. let's see if it's, how different it is. I know. Well, I know there. I did read that there are like some some little changes here and there, but it sounds like the the movie actually kind of tells the story like more effectively than the book, just based on like what I read about like the changes from it. Hmm. But I'll let you be the judge of that because I do not feel like reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any final thoughts? And want to give our ratings about Rumblefish or just yes, final thoughts in general. Rumblefish. Uh, I, I think it was a nice little, uh, a nice little, uh, a supporting slot for uh, Nick Cage to, uh, polish up his acting chops a little bit. It's probably a good thing this came out after Valley Girl rather than before, because I think this performance was, like, probably what got him a little bit more exposure. Uh, I don't know how many people were cast, were, were gonna want to cast him based on like his performance in Valley Girl, but I can, I could see people wanting to cast him based on his performance in this movie. And, and, and as I, I said, I actually just really like this movie uh, a whole lot. And uh, Cage was good in it for what sh sh short amount of time he was in it. So yeah, in general, I really liked it. Bonnie. Um, are we giving our reviews or is this our final thoughts? Final thoughts for the the movie itself. I like it a lot better since thinking about it in the uh, framework that Leon proposed of it being more theatrical. Um, if if you think about it, the way that a play is supposed to be presented, it's a lot better than what it produced for film. Um, but I also do agree that they did some cool things um, with the lighting, the shots. So they tried. <laughs> A for effort. <laughs> That's kind of a. Yeah. <laughs> I'd I'd watch it for the Nick Cage scenes again, and maybe some of the artistic shots, but eh, it's it's okay. It's not the best film, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But all right, and now we're going to move on to our final segment of the podcast that we call. <laughs> Movie Review Haikus. Movie Review Haikus is the most elegant way to review films. Haikus are a form of Japanese poetry. They have three lines. The first line is five syllables, the second is seven, and the last is five. So this is our fun way of summarizing our thoughts and feelings toward the film. So who would like to go first? I'll do it. I'll just jump in. I only have, I only have the one. Um... Here we go. Oh my god, that hair. Nicolas Cage, what the hell? Also, it's black and white. <laughs> ah, nice. very good. Perfect. Good one. I want to go next. Okay. What a fuck up. Rusty James, not just the movie. Yeah, the movie too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go because I have two. God. Um, <laughs> pretentious art film. The score gives me a headache. I miss Valley Girl. Ooh, strong words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess I have to go since you have two, uh, so that you can, of course, have the last word. Um, <laughs> You're welcome to create more than one if you'd like to have the last word. <laughs> I feel like I feel like each 
I feel like however many I create, you're going to have one more than that. So, so I, won't I never do more than three, so that's the standard. Okay, uh, here's mine. What a dumb title. Oh, Siamese Fighting Fish. What a dumb title. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and finally, the last word. Uh, here we go. Angry haiku. What's black, white, and red all over? My face watching this. Ha! Mine was stronger. <laughs> mine was stronger. I, I feel like Nate won. Okay, you win. Not yeah, that, look, wins. we're not trying to make it a competition. Even but so, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. That was awesome. Okay. Um, so thanks for listening, everyone. We're going to do some plugs now. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash the Whedon fan and the number one on Twitter at the Whedon fan and on Facebook, just search the Whedon fan. Um, would anyone else like to plug some stuff? Sure. Uh, uh, I, you can find me at renegadecut.com and you can uh, make sure my show keeps going and I don't cancel it because ad revenue is bad now by going to patreon.com slash renegade cut. Yes, support creative people. Yes, and yeah. Renegade Cut's great, so you guys need to... Good show. To it. Thank you. Uh, you can find me wherever uh, there is injustice. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will rise. Uh, and also, failing that, uh, I am uh, thenatezone.tumblr.com. Uh, I am at Nate Trees, T-R-E-E-S-E, on uh, Twitter. And uh, stay away from my Facebook. It's uh, it's not for you. <laughs> yeah, ditto. I always get I, my Facebook page. I have a Facebook fan page, but my actual Facebook page is just for friends and colleagues. And uh, people like random people keep trying to ask me to come in. And it's like, no, no, that's why I have Twitter. That's why I have Twitter. <laughs> yeah. All right. You can Bye. find Did me you have anything? Oh. at the Monster Girl, B O N like monster but with a b uh dot tumblr .com. oh i see clever i get it <laughs> oh my god you guys have only known me for years <laughs> i know i just i just pretended i understood what your url was until just now I fi i'm figuring out actually i just now got that <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was just a funny phrase oh god <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> okay so you can find us, the podcast, on uh, Twitter at EnterTheCagePod. You can also find our Tumblr at EnterTheCage.tumblr.com. And this should be up on SoundCloud. Just search Enter the Cage, and hopefully it will be up on iTunes whenever this eventually goes up. Um, next week, we'll, or next time, we'll be reviewing 1984's Racing with the Moon. So if you want to submit your own movie review haiku, or just tell us how much you love us, or leave us a comment, or subscribe... Do that on our social media, or how much you hate us, because we could use the traffic. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be good. <laughs> any yeah, any true. feedback is good feedback. You know you've mm -hmm. made it once you have haters. Oh, I know. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> so, any final thoughts before we close out? Uh, you know, see this movie. Go ahead and see it. <laughs> <laughs> I. But it has a dumb title. I do not right. side with that. <laughs> yeah, I disagree. There, but. there are better Nick Cage movies. Watch Valley Girl instead. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, that's right. You two were the Air pro. Five, Bonnie. I forgot you two were the pro Valley Girl people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on that note, it's time to put the bunny back in the box. But we'll see you next week on Enter the Cage. Enter the Cage is a Curious Manatee production. Executive producer Tyler Flynn, technical consultant Dave Rodriguez, logo designed by Jen Ng, and theme song by Johnny D. Rod. Good call.